Uh, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to our overseas guests. I would like to start by thanking everyone for coming in person or for attending this event uh, remotely. I express my deepest gratitude to the Medieval Institute, especially to its director, Tom Berman, Father Alexis Torrance, Megan Hall, and Thompson Gaster for their warm hospitality, generosity, help, and support since day one. I feel truly privileged and blessed to have been given the opportunity to spend an academic year in such a friendly, inspiring, and nurturing environment. And now I will go through, my, uh, through the content of my project by summarizing it, emphasizing its main points, uh, and illustrating them by including some relevant examples from the source material. Uh, the title of my project, I just want to uh, share the screen, yeah? The title of my project is uh, quite descriptive. Liturgical poetry in the Middle Byzantine period, hymns attributed to Germanos I, Patriarch of Constantinople, 715-730. And the title itself uh, probably, probably reflects the complexity of the topic. It consists of an introduction, three chapters, a conclusion, and an analytic catalog of hymns attached to the name Germanos. Of course, each, each of these uh, chapters is divided into several sub-chapters. In, in the introduction, I refer first to the importance of hymnography as genre. I just want to... Thompson, please. <laughs> Yes. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, uh, liturgical poetry or hymnography is one of the most fertile genre, genres of Byzantine literature. As an integral part of the church ritual, liturgical hymns provided a very effective means of communicating dogmatic truths and conveying ethic, ethical ideals to the congregation as well as lending a voice to the faithful for establishing communication with the transcendent world, with God, angels, the Virgin Mary, and the saints. As a combination of words and music, hymns can produce a strong impression upon the minds of the faithful and play an important role in their spiritual edification. Quite contrary, to many other genres of medieval literature, mostly destined for the educated elite, or at least fairly literate people, liturgical poetry with its relatively easily understandable language was accessible to ordinary illiterate audiences in both monasteries and parish churches. In the epoch when people were less exposed to acoustic and visual impressions than nowadays, hymnography along with sacred, sacred images frequently valued as a way of preaching to the illiterate was an extremely influ influential medium. Uh, due to the fact that to be a Christian at that time meant to go to church, participate in the liturgy, and listen to the texts read and sung there, liturgical poetry is regarded as a key source for understanding Byzantine theological doctrine, piety, morality, and asceticism. Methodology. My approach to, to the very rich, very rich hymnographic production of the Middle Byzantine period involves focusing on a selection of the hymns that are attributed to one particular author, belong to one specific tradition, and can be roughly dated to, to a specific period of time. I test this approach here where the case study is Germanos, the author to whom the hymns are ascribed. The tradition is Constantinopolitan, and the period is the Middle Byzantine, mostly up to the end of the 11th century. I, sp I pay special attention to the content and certain important formal features of a set of largely unpublished hymns composed during the iconoclastic or post-iconoclastic periods. Aside from bringing to light a considerable body of our published hymnographical material, I examine these hymns as a separate genre of Byzantine literature that served a practical function. And when we study hymnography, one of the fundamental questions that arise is how to deal methodologically with texts that cannot be precisely anchored in time or tied to a particular author, 
but is instead appear uh, timeless. This is a feature of other expressions of Byzantine intellectual and artistic production, including icons, wall paintings, <coughs> mosaics, and so, and so on, all frequently quite difficult to precisely date and even harder to relate to a specific author. Yet it is this character of Byzantine liturgical hymns that has made them relevant for church communities throughout centuries, regardless of geographical, social, historical, or other context. What I want to say is that, yes, it is difficult to uh, contextualize timeless texts like hymns or wall paintings depicting a biblical story, but such texts and depictions fit in and can be applied to any context. The spiritual needs uh, the faithful have are similar regardless if they live in the 8th, 15th or 21st centuries. Uh, what I wish to propose is that depending on the kind of information one desires to extract, the date and authorship are not always as uh, of crucial importance. This is especially true of texts text like hymns that are designed for congregational use, where, is, uh, where reception by a certain community is more important. So I adopt the Foucauldian concept of the author function, here, the name Girmanos does not exclusively refer to a historical figure, but to an organizing principle whose function is to group together a large body of hymnographic texts attributed to Girmanos, regardless of whether they belong to him or not. And since my primary objective is to see these hymns as agents of conveying certain messages to the congregation, my methodological approach is primarily thematic. Uh, in other words, in my analysis, I have confined myself to examining how the hymns both responded, responded and contributed to the development of the three predominant cults of the period, namely those of the Virgin Mary, the saints and relics. And to achieve this, I place the hymns devoted to these topics in dialogue with other genres and types of discourse, including sermons, the lives of the saints, theological writings on image veneration, biblical hermeneutics, and liturgical commentaries, as well as with the ritual itself. Over 100 hymns are attributed to Hermanos I in liturgical books, in special editions of liturgical hymns, and in manuscripts. The vast majority of these texts uh, were composed before the 11th century, as the manuscript edition testifies. Less than one third of the hymns are currently used in the liturgy of the Orthodox Church, while one third still remained unedited. And since a, a significant number of these hymns are not published, a significant aspect of my research consists of the analysis of relevant manuscripts for different uh, collections like Sinai, uh, Mount Thassus, Library, National Library of Athens, Paris, and some other centers. A question of authorship. In the Byzantine tradition, Patriarch Germanos I was remembered primarily for his defense of image veneration. He was regarded as one of the leading figures during the first phase of the iconoclastic crisis, as he opposed the iconoclastic policy of Leo III. And because of that, he was deposed in 730. The opus of the hymnographic works attributed to Germanos is vast. However, it is not an easy task to prove whether the attribution are justifiable or, or, or not. Uh, we have here two uh, specific testimonies about him as a hymnographer. Both are from the 10th century, which means two centuries after he lived. And uh, the one is from the manuscript of Ma um, Patmos Monastery, where it is said that he produced tropologia for all the feasts and many or more saints. And the other uh, sources Synaxarion of Constantinople, where it is said that uh, with his melodies and hymns, he alleviated the difficulty of the vigils. Uh, along with this, we have also in, in canons, especially attributed to him in manuscript editions, there are three ways that he is mentioned there. 
there are only one canon for the exaltation of the Holy Cross, where in the rubrics he's man, it is mentioned P Magir Manu Patriarchu. And the canon for the Nativity of the Virgin Mary, P Magir Manu, again in the rubrics, and the majority of these attributions are in the ma margins of, of the of manuscripts, and usually Germanu. However, when I started uh, to examine these schemes one by one, I was confronted with, some, uh, with a set of problems. For example, there is one canon attributed to Germanos, and this canon is for Saint, Saint Eustath Eustathius, the confessor, who died in the ninth century, which means one generation after Germanos lived. Another indication that at least 19 commemorations, or, or 19 canons for the commemorations of the saints that are not mentioned in the so-called Moncelli calendar, which reflects the tradition and the calendar of Constantinople from the, some scholars say be, beginning of the eighth century, others say the end. So, but there we don't have 19 commemorations of, of the saints that we have canons attached to the name of Germanos. Of course, this is an indication. And the attribution uh, could refer only to the modus stanzas, to, to hear me, because canons especially are uh, complex liturgical uh, hymns. Their hymnographers can use modus stanzas that were circulating in uh, separate collections and attributed to specific authors, hymnographers like Germanos, and later hymnographers could just simply use those models and later script uh, copies when they would uh, copy that manuscript would just uh, mention Germanos and with and referring only to the to the Hirmi. So the first uh, major topic of my uh, draft, my book manuscript is uh, Mariology. It needs to be noted that as a powerful expression of devotion to the Virgin, Mario Mariological hymns experienced an unprecedented development during the period that this, this study investigates. They abound with terms and formulations coined in relation to the prolonged controversy over the person of Christ, while at the same time emphasizing Mary's intercessory role on behalf of the faithful. Marian hymns sung in the context of the liturgy, not only served to praise the virgin, virgin, but also to bring her closer to the faithful and allow them to approach her on a, same, on a more personal and exper experiential level. <clears throat> they could now appeal to her directly, even initiate a dialogue and also confess their sins and ask for intercession with God. The first hymn is for the Nativity of the Virgin Mary which is preserved, has been preserved in three manuscripts. And uh, uh, Virgin Mary, along with the Virgin Mary, a prominent place is also given to her parents, especially her mother Anna, as well as to Christ. We can discern a balance between Mariology and Christology in this hymn uh, to emphasize the Virgin Mary's meaning and importance for the salvation of humankind. The, the hymnographer applies several most characteristic Old Testament types as uh, as an illustration, I will include these four examples where we have um, Mary is praised as the ladder of heaven, the bush that does not burn, the gate of heaven, the table which holds the heavenly bread. Also, uh, in these four troparia or stanzas, we have each of them ends with a refrain. The virgin is born to the glory of the holy of our, whole, whole of our race. But on this aspect, uh, Father Damaskinos will talk a bit more in his uh, today's paper. Now, the <clears throat> Annunciation of the Virgin Mary, another important hymnological uh, canon. Uh, both Nativity and Annunciation were, were related to the Halkopratia Church, the, the, and that church was uh, in direct relation to the patriarch, Constantinopolitan patriarchs, so it makes sense that Germanos could really be, have been the author of these texts. And I uh, specifically chose just this, this example, uh, where we can see how hymnographers 
built on earlier patristic texts. Here we have the use of, of uh, the letter by Dionysius, Pseudo Dionysius Aeropagitis, where we have this uh, very specific uh, ex uh, phrases like omen on ari, uh, ari, uh, that uh, what is to be said of it is in, ineffable and what is to be understood of it is unknowable. Uh, Annunciation canon is for the incarnation actually or, or conception of Jesus Christ and here Pseudo Dionysius talks about uh, also speaks about um, incarnation and uses the same these phrases and I think there is no uh, no doubt that the hymnographer used this source, and it seems also that he was very educated. This is not one of the main writings attributed from Corpus Dionysiacum, it's just one letter, very short. And another important, but in hymnography it was very common to use patristic sources, to use the lives of saints and other treatises and uh, works of previous fathers of the church. And another important point here, also a very old, Tradition, tradition that existed is this this the Eve Mary analogy. Today, the word of the archangel threw out the serpent's poison from Eve's ears. A very old idea. The sec, the third canon is for the Hippopandi. Uh, it has a very strong Christological character with a heavy emphasis placed on, placed on the mystery, mystery of the Incarnation and its soter soteriological implications. Uh, it is, this hymn is preserved only in one manuscript from the 19th century. It's very hard to say if it belongs to Germans or not. Uh, there are some other also indications that may exclude him. But uh, I also uh, an interesting idea is the mention of Simeon, who was sort of a for, forerunner, like right? John ba the Baptist, who also uh, announced Jesus' arrival in two hastes, uh, like uh, John the Baptist. So next, I just need to go a bit uh, faster just to remain in, within time limit. Uh, and just to summarize, uh, another important, uh, uh, as for the Mariological hymns, just in general, uh, the, uh, the, author, the author of these three hymns uh, are not, is not exclusively focused on Mary's intercessory roles, which is also present there, as one could expect from liturgical texts intended to be used in liturgy. Rather, they primarily underscore the Virgin's pivotal role in the incarnation and accordingly her place in the economy of salvation with a substantial contribution to, salvation of, to the salvation of humankind. Accordingly, the hymns under discussion summarize the main points of the Mariological teachings against the background of the recent or even contemporary iconoclastic disputes uh, the, co the controversy initiated a profound recapitulation of Christology, especially the teaching about Christ's incarnation, uh, facilitated by the Virgin Mary's synergy in the event. Another important point in the Marian devotion generated a sort of Mariological interpretation of the scriptures, as we could see those uh, images from the Old Testament. As for the hagiographical poetry, uh, the largest set of, of hymns attributed to Patriarch Germanos are devoted to the celebration of saints. The main purpose of all hagiographical genres is to glorify saints and demonstrate that they were imbued with divine grace. Since grace is also available to those who turn to, turn, uh, to, to saints in prayer, hagiographical hymns with their intercessory and penitential character could be seen as a complement to saints' biographies and in particular as a uniquely suitable vehicles, vehicle for addressing holy figures. Through hymns, which often feature dialogues or monologues, the congregation is lent a voice to address saints within the liturgical context, which is the most appropriate avenue for seeking saints' intercession with God for the forgiveness of sins and salvation. Uh, the liturgical commemoration of saints with the use of hymns as one of its key elements bridges the distance between the sacred past and the here and now of liturgical performance, and in the process renders the celebrated holy person present, uh, present in, in access, uh, and accessible to the congregation. 
And the hymnographers, similarly to the preachers, very much like the word today or now, just to uh, make the event, uh, to make the saint or the event present to, uh, to the time of the, of the, of the faithful. The eulogizing of saints in hymns not only serves to keep their memory alive, its primarily, primary function is to provide a setting within which the saints can assume an active role within the church community and exercise their protective and intercessory roles on behalf of their devotees. Appeals to the saints' intercession are especially common in hagiographical hymns, uh, Thus, in uh, uh, the unpublished canon for the birth of John the Baptist, also ascribed to Germanos, we read that we beseech you, pray fervently for the salvation of our souls. Uh, saints are also uh, quite uh, often mentioned, and probably in the context of the iconoclastic polemic, where both uh, iconophile, iconoclastic parties parties defended positions by referring to saints as inspiring examples of the faithful, they use the word image. Uh, like here we have that uh, for the canon for the female saint Zinaida, we, uh, the hymnographer says that she is an icon and model of the pious way of life and exhort, exhortation to, to piety. The same idea is also uh, voiced in the canon to St. Abercius, Bishop of Hierapolis, where it is said that he is an icon of virtues. But uh, the, patriarch, uh, the, the canon for Patriarch uh, Paul, the confessor, Patriarch Constantinople, uh, is of, it's of particular interest as it features terminology related to image making, which is here applied to saints' ascetic life. So we all recognize you as a painter of virtues. Oh, Father, you modeled your life according to the image of God, not with material colors, but with teachings of grace. Of course, another very common uh, topic in hagiographical hymns is modeling the saints on biblical figures. And of course, presenting saints as models for imitation. Uh, this practice was one of the ways to demonstrate the unity between the Old and New Testament, and especially to stress the notion of continuity in, his, in the history of the chosen people from the Old and New Israel, as the Christians frequently characterize themselves. Here we have, uh, for example, how Moses is, so we have many often mentioned new Moseses, Abrahams, or other uh, Old Testament figures, and how the saints are uh, they are replica, in a way. So, having emulated Moses, you led out the new chosen people from the deceit of the Egyptians into the land of promise and gave them water from the rock of knowledge. Of course, the first uh, uh, ode of the canon is always uh, is, is uh, based on the ode of Moses, and that just inspired and gave the opportunity to the hymnographer to use this, this image. Also, we have a new Abrahams and with the use of, of uh, especially here in this example, there is a use of uh, allegory, where it is said that, oh father, you emulated Abraham's sacrifice acceptable to God since you set forth your blood as the other Isaac and offered the body as a lamb, having offered yourself as a whole burnt offering, a sacrifice acceptable to God. And in hymnography, we also have some images, and especially Old Testament figures, uh, quite frequently related to the emperor. As Joshua, for example, and this is a canon uh, from, for the first of September, where you, you who were fellow general to your servant Joshua against his opponent in the past, now to be fellow general to the emperors against their enemies. And there are many references in this kind of to to Joshua and to Joshua and the emperor probably here it will be easier to contextualize that him especially if we have in mind that uh, Joshua was very popular in the 10th century in the context of the Byzantine wars in the east and the third uh, topic is relics we have 
several, uh, that was a common topic in Byzantine hymnography. Hymnographers showed profound reverence for relics and extolled their, extolled their miraculous properties, and they drive away evil spirits, clean the Christians uh, from sins, cure all sickness. They are stronghold, uh, stronghold against the barbarians. They are protection, source of knowledge, and so on. There are seven such hymns attributed to Germanos. I focused especially on uh, three of them. The one is Exaltation of the Holy Cross, which also contains references to the Holy Lands. And both these relics were transferred to Constantinople in the seventh century. Now, holy, uh, they were part of ritual in Constantinople. And uh, there are some, uh, for example, today, even to, it, it, Elonhi, especially, the lens has Eucharistic uh, character. It is still today, you know, for the knife that uh, uh, priests used to, do pre to pre prepare the bread and wine for the Holy Eucharist, it is called a lens. And I venerate, venerate and glorify the cross and lens which pierced, O oh Lord, your immaculate side that springs to us streams of immortality and incorruption. I think there should be an also Eucharistic connotation here. As for the Holy Cross, uh, it has been related to the, it was related to the emperor from the time of Constantine the Great. And, uh, but now in this hymn specific, it is used as uh, in anti-Muslim, anti-Arab polemic in the uh, Middle Byzantine period. So in the same way as you defeated the Amalekites, the foreigners in Sinai, by the hands put in the form of the cross, subject those of Hagar to the most pious emperor. Uh, another important uh, other hymn that I uh, analyzed in more detail is for the invention of the first and second inventions of, of the head of John the Baptist. Uh, again, uh, maybe th how the hymnographer presents this event, it also could pro possibly be related to uh, Eucharistic, Eucharist, and for example, come gaze at the skull of the forerunner, which once dripped his blood on the plate, and is a source of astonishing miracles under the altar now, and uh, just it brings to mind the, that sometimes the head of John the Baptist is depicted as uh, put on a plate pattern and on the altar. So and we have such images in this, in this canon as well. This is a, an icon from Mount Sinai. And of course, cult of sacred images. We have many references to the icons in this, uh, in, especially in the canon for Mary of Egypt, the earliest. Uh, him, I mean, the earliest manuscript where this hymn is preserved is the end of the ninth century. And uh, here, salvation of Mary of Egypt is re directly related to her devotion of the veneration of holy icons. Blessed Mary was saved, O Virgin, when she re resorted to your icon. Of, again, in the canon for Joshua, the son of Nun, it is said that grant victory to the emperors who venerate with faith your image and those of the mother of God and all the saints. Uh, the end, this is, uh, with this, I finish my third chapters. And then what follows is an extensive catalog of all hymns attributed to Germanos. Either they are in liturgical use today or not. I also indicate their manuscript where they are preserved for the uh, published hymns. There are also some editions, like Analecta Hymnica Greca for additional manuscript from the South Italy. Also, many hymns that are attributed to Germanos as well. And that's it for now. Thank you for your attention. We will discuss this a bit further. Thank you.